This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're going to talk today about a topic that is so important. As you know, we've got coming up right here on KRLD on September the 23rd at 6 p.m. I'm listening. And we need to talk about removing the stigma around seeking behavioral health treatment. We're delighted that we have with us today Sherry Cusimano, who is the Executive Director of Community Education at Medical City Green Oaks. Sherry, let me ask you, what do you think about removing the stigma around behavioral health? Well, I think it's about time. You know, mental health is part of our overall health. I always say that. And really, it should be no more of a shame to seek help for a mental illness than it is to go see the doctor about the flu. It should be just as easy. There should be no shame around it. Unfortunately, over the years, there has been a great deal of, of stigma around a lot of different health care issues, really, if you think about it. You know, people used to think that seizures were demon possession, right? So mental health, unfortunately, has has had a great deal of stigma around it, as has addiction. And the sooner we can accept that as being part of our overall health and seek help for that and get help as soon as possible, the better off we're going to be. Because we all know that the earlier you get treatment, the better the outcome is going to be. You know, it's it's even kind of built into our language, right? When we talk about a situation that frustrates us, oftentimes we'll talk about it as being, you know, crazy or wacko or something like that. The term, as we use it, has a lot of negative connotations. Mental health concerns, mental health issues are not any more negative than any other health issue. You know, the the stigma somebody who has a mental illness feels around seeking help or acknowledging a mental illness, that's called self-stigma, right? It's where we, you know, we all live in this culture. We've received these messages that mental illnesses mean you're somehow defective or deficient. And so we kind of label ourselves and feel less than. But unfortunately... Many people in our culture have, you know, will gladly reinforce that for us in their language, in their actions. Uh, you know, that, that makes it a whole lot worse. Totally agree. You know, for the listeners out there, especially the ones, as you know, since February and March, many people have been at home. They're getting frustrated. Some have obviously had economic hardships, et cetera. Sherry, if you see a friend, a family member, a colleague that really is having some type of change in their behavior, and you know that's something bothering them, how do you approach them, and what do you say? Basically, I think the kindest thing to do is to be both compassionate but also honest with people. And if you notice a change in behavior, you know, you see somebody who normally may be happy-go-lucky or doing well and and all of a sudden they seem to uh, lack enthusiasm about life, they seem a little down and you're worried about them, I think it's okay to be a mirror for your friend and to say, you know, you don't seem like your usual self. Is something going on? And usually, if you approach it that way, people will respond. You know, if they're struggling, typically I find they'll open up and say, yeah, you know, it's been a rough week or, yeah, I have been a little down. And that kind of gets the conversation going. And let's say that they respond and they respond in a way where they do say, Thank you for asking. I am having some problems. In fact, I think I need to get some professional help. What would you say then? I would say, hallelujah, good for you. (laughs) 
that may sound like a ridiculous response, but somebody said that to me once when I was in a situation very much like that, and I don't mind sharing that. Uh, I was really struggling and decided to reach out for help. Somebody asked me about it, and I said, you know, I think I'll reach out for help. I was expecting that person to say, what? Because at the time, I was a healthcare professional, and I felt embarrassed about it. I had some of that self-stigma going on. And that person said, oh, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad you're going to reach out and get help. And I said, you are? <laughs> Because that wasn't my internal feeling. I expected that that person would be disappointed in me. And instead, they were happy for me. I even would offer, uh, if it was a friend of mine, I would even say, oh, I, I would encourage you to get the help that you're wanting. In fact, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. If you want me to go with you, I'll be happy to do that. Just feel free to ask for anything you think might help out. As we pivot a little bit and look at uh, some of the serious, serious issues associated when someone's severely depressed uh, that could lead to suicide, if you're noticing significant behavioral changes, especially in family and friends, are there any key warning signs related to potential suicide? Yes, there are. You know, when people start saying things like um, they quit making plans, they change their behavior, especially with adolescents. If they start withdrawing and isolating and pulling away. Now, during the pandemic, I'm not quite sure how, how you gauge all of this, right? Because we're all a little bit isolated, which I think increases the risk of some of these problems. Um, but again, I would address it in a, if I began to see some of those things, I began to see changes. Maybe the person was more irritable. Maybe they were pulling away. Maybe they were giving away items. That's, that's a big red flag when people start giving, you know, acting like they're wrapping up loose ends, making amends to people. I had a friend who, uh, called and said, you know, I, I was thinking about something that happened several years ago, and I just wanted to uh, make amends for that. So I listened. But the more I listened to the person talk, the more I thought, you know, this sounds a little bit like this person trying to clean the slate to say goodbye. And so I asked the person, can you meet me for lunch? And they said, yes. And we met for lunch and we talked. And I said, you know, I'm a little worried about you. You seem really down. Are you thinking about suicide? And she kind of stopped and said, well, well, yeah, I've been, yeah, yeah, I am. And that story from Sherry Cusimano from Medical City Green Oaks is exactly what I'm listening is all about. And please stay with us because when we come back, we will hear the rest of the story with Sherry Cusimano and her friend. On September 23rd, the I'm Listening program here on 1080 KRLD and Radio.com. And once again, sponsored this year by all of the North Texas hospitals through the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. Please stay with us. The rest of the story with Sherry's friend coming up next on The Human Side of Healthcare. This is The Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the Radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome back to The Human Side of Healthcare. When we took our break, we were talking with Sherry Cusimano from Medical City Green Oaks in Dallas who was visiting with a friend over lunch who was contemplating suicide. Sherry was being alert with her friend, sensed something wrong, and took her to lunch and asked her about it. Well, now, here's the rest of the story. She did go to a therapist. She did get help. She didn't commit suicide, thank God. But I think paying attention to some of those things and asking questions and Offering to help in whatever way you can is a good idea. Um, if somebody seems skittish at work, for example, I would say, you know, can we have coffee on a break or something and chat and try and get with them privately and then ask them. 
privately, is something going on with you? Do we need to go out for dinner tonight and talk some more? You know, just lay the opportunity out there for the person to share with you what's really going on and then talk about options. Have you talked to your doctor about this? Uh, have you seen a therapist before? You know, just talking about the different self-help groups. There are all kinds of ways that people can get support and get through those difficult times and just to kind of let them know you don't have to go through this alone can be very important. You know, you bring up a good point during that conversation. In the case of your friend, you had lunch, and after a while, you just asked the question, are you thinking about suicide? Is that the right approach? I've had people say, oh, don't mention it. You'll put that thought in their head. Oh, my goodness, no. I have never had anybody say, oh, gee, I never thought about that. I think I will now <laughs> when I ask that question. It, it isn't that kind of thing. If people are not suicidal and you ask that question, what they'll say is, no, oh, no, I'm, no. No, it's not that bad. I really, but, I, you know, and then go on to explain more what they're going through. It, it happens real quick if they're not. But what if they are and you didn't ask? That's the risky question. You know, when you think in terms of suicide, and I know this doesn't happen that frequently, but it does, and then it becomes high profile. Suicide packs or copycat suicides, can you help our listeners unpack that and understand what that's all about? Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a scary situation, and it does happen. I think you see it probably more, it, it's kind of like the Romeo and Juliet story, I guess, huh? And, and yet, you don't want to romanticize it that way. You don't want to paint it as, as a romantic picture, but that's oftentimes the picture that kids may have, especially adolescents, may have in their mind when they're thinking about that. They don't understand that what they're thinking about is irreversible. They just don't have that concept yet, and so we see that a lot with adolescents. I think it's also important to notice who your kids are hanging out with, and if, if it's a different group or something's going on in that group that doesn't feel right, pay attention to your instincts around that and ask questions. And the other thing is never keep secrets. And I always, I used to be the uh, program director for the adolescent program, and I used to tell the kids, don't keep secrets from the staff, especially the dangerous secrets. If somebody is uh, planning on doing something that could be harmful to themselves, tell somebody. Care enough about your friends to tell somebody. It's not a good thing to keep their confidence if they're planning to hurt themselves and you keep their secret. My final question uh, for you, Sherry, I've heard people when they had a blessed event in their life, like the birth of a child, and they said, yeah, the mother's a little blue, the mother's a little depressed. It's probably a little postpartum depression, but that's only temporary. But that still can be quite serious, can't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, if that goes on, that, that kind of baby blues thing, if that goes on longer than two weeks, well, you need to get help. I mean, then we we consider that to be postpartum depression is a serious, serious thing. We've seen several incidents of that where people didn't get the help they needed. And I, I think that that to me is really tragic because there is help for that. You know, there is a biochemical reason for the things we go through with mental illnesses. It's not a, a weakness. It's not just all in your head. <laughs> Especially after pregnancy, there are changes in your hormonal levels. There are all kinds of things happening, and you've got a new being, a new person that you're charged with taking care of, and it's not unusual to feel inadequate and to get down about that. And if that goes on for too long, I think you need to reach out. The literature says two weeks. If it goes on for two weeks, get help. I think it's, I would encourage people to reach out even sooner and to get the support you need right away, actually, from family members and friends. In fact, 
if you know you're going to have a baby, I think it's a great idea to have, if you've got family to support you, to have them with you for the first week or so, if possible, at least part of the time, uh, to help with all the things that have to be done and consider the fact that you're going to be sleep deprived (laughs) with a whole lot of responsibility. I encourage women to get support and get professional help if the depression goes on for more than, I would say, more than a week even. Chat with someone. You know, Sherry, I've asked you a few questions, but I know you're an expert related to removing the stigma, dealing with suicide, depression, bipolar, all of the above. What question should I have asked you that I didn't? You know, I just really want to stress the importance of There is no shame in getting help. Please, especially right now, I think the pandemic has hit us all pretty hard. We've been through a lot in a short period of time, right? Actually, in a longer period of time than most of us would have wanted to go through it. Uh, We've been isolated. Everything has changed in our lives. So it it would not surprise me to see somebody who has always thrived, done well, been happy-go-lucky, be struggling all of a sudden. We have seen that. We've seen that at NAMI where, you know, I'm the president of NAMI North Texas. So we receive a lot of calls from, from different people. Our crisis calls are up. More people are saying, you know, I've never struggled before, but all of a sudden I'm having trouble just getting up and doing anything. So great, you called us. We're so glad you decided to call us. A lot of people are out there struggling right now that haven't been through that before. 53% of the population, according to the Kaiser Foundation, an article I was just reading, are acknowledging that they're feeling depression or anxiety right now. Now, that's more than half of the population that participated in this survey are saying, I'm either depressed or anxious. So you're not alone. There's a lot of other people going through it. Reach out, talk to someone. The quicker you do, uh, the quicker you're going to feel better about yourself, the quicker things are going to pull together for you. We know early intervention is really a form of prevention. You can prevent so many headaches if you get help early. So the brain is part of the body, right? Right. And just like if we have uh, diabetes or high blood pressure, something going on with some other part of our body, the brain can be affected too. So when we're going through despair, reach out, get some help. The other thing we know is that addictive disorders seem to be skyrocketing. There's uh, like a 13.3% increase in addictive disorders is what I just read. So we know that that's not a surprise. We know that when people are going through isolation, loneliness, change, and trauma, and a lot of this has been traumatic, right, that we're vulnerable to substance use disorders. So that's another thing. Get healthy coping mechanisms to help you through this, reaching out to people, getting exercise, taking care of yourself. Try and do things that make it better for you in the long run. You know, Thomas, we've had Sherry on the show for the last three years because she's just been awesome as far as participating in I'm Listening. But you know, every time I hear her, I learn something new. You know why? Because she's been there. That's the deal with Sherry. She's real. She has experienced her own challenges in this area with both mental health and addictions. And she's just real. She's very open about her journey. Now we're going to make a shift and take this conversation over to kids next. Sue Shell from Children's Health is going to be with us and she's going to talk about mental health, behavioral health, and how it impacts our children. And just a quick reminder of our podcast. It's called The Human Side of Healthcare, and it's on all the major podcast players. We'd love to have you join us there, where we put the full-length interviews that we don't have time for here. Our kids next on The Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and radio.com. 
The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted that you're with us today. You know, we're going to talk about a very serious topic dealing with behavioral health. As you know, KRLD is going to promote I'm Listening. It's coming up this coming week, and we thought it only appropriate that we talk about children and adolescents and how they're affected by mental health. And we need to remove any stigma of them getting treatment, and we certainly need to intervene before there is any acts related to suicide. We have a real professional with us today. We're delighted that we've got Sue Shell the Vice President and Clinical Director of Behavioral Health with Children's Health. Sue, thanks for being on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here and to let people know about the importance of identifying depression in children and adolescents. You know, Sue, many times, not only parents, but aunts, uncles, grandparents may not realize some of the things that they need to watch or symptoms to know if their child is depressed or even thinking about suicide. What are your thoughts related to that? Yeah, that's a a great point. A lot of people don't realize that mental illness, most mental illness starts before the age of 14. So kids and adolescents have symptoms. If there's an adult who's depressed, they likely had issues when they were much, much younger that went unidentified. So it's important to know and talk about behavioral health and and understand what your child is going through and, and looking for clues in their behavior. Children and adolescents don't show depression like adults do. They may not be crying or withdrawn. They may be irritable. They may be acting out more. They may be Uh, more aggressive or argumentative and you have to understand and and ask questions and figure out what's causing that change in their behavior. A lot of things can lead to depression certainly if there's a family illness um, somebody that's depressed that can can be transferred to children biologically but also stress. We talk now about adverse childhood experiences where kids under significant stress living in poverty or uh, families going through divorce or life changes, moving to a new school, conflict in the home, um, that causes stress to the child. And, And now with COVID, it's even more so with the quarantine, people losing jobs. Mom and dad are are under stress, that transfers to the child as well. And so you have to to look and see how they're responding to a difficult situation and make sure that you're talking about it and addressing it. You know, for our listeners, if they think the child is struggling, what do you recommend they do? And more importantly, how do they talk about it? Yes, like with all healthy habits, you have to start young. And so We need to, as families, develop healthy behavioral health habits as well. So talking about feelings and emotions when kids are very, very young, you know, if you, if you see a child is very frustrated with something or appears angry, give them words to understand what they're feeling to say, boy, you, you look like you're angry. What are you upset about something? And, and telling them at a young age, you know, when I'm upset, I feel better when I talk about it. Would you like to talk about it? You know, those are healthy habits that as families we can can develop just as we work hard to help our kids develop, you know, healthy eating habits and exercise, uh, putting behavioral health in, into that as well. Depression is all over the news, and kids know that too, and they know friends and particularly adolescents that have struggled with depression or anxiety. So don't be afraid to talk about it. We give families some conversation starters, such as saying, you know, I heard in the news that 
youth suicide has been increasing or what do you think about suicide? Some people think, oh, I don't want to talk about it. It'll put the thought in their mind. And that is absolutely not true. In fact, research shows that people that have been thinking of suicide are appreciative and do better when somebody brings it up and and talks about it. And so certainly if there's an event within the community, in the school or somewhere that is in the news and the child hears about it, definitely talk about it directly with them. Let them know that feelings and moods are never permanent um, and that it's very sad that a child or teen or anyone didn't see any other alternatives before taking their their life because there always are other options, but you have to, to talk about it and and get someone else to help you solve problems. You know, Sue, you know the landscape in Texas, and unfortunately many counties in Texas don't have mental health facilities. Many counties don't even have a psychiatrist or a clinical specialist dealing with behavioral health. So sometimes it's hard to know what to do, who to turn to. To our listeners, and especially the parents out there, if they are concerned and their child is struggling, what do you recommend they do? Who do they call? Can you give them some advice? Absolutely. Uh, One of the things we've been working on at Children's Health for several years is to make behavioral health care a part of everyday health care. And one way to do that is by better equipping our primary care providers, our pediatricians, to uh, be able to treat behavioral health issues within their office practice. So I'm very excited that this past spring, the state funded and implemented a new program called the Child Psychiatric Access Network, or CPAN. And essentially what this is, is it's an initiative to create where we've created a system where pediatric primary care providers can make a phone call to receive a consultation from a mental health provider and a child adolescent psychiatrist in real time. So for a pediatrician, they can enroll in this program. It's no cost. It's fully funded by the state and have access to this consultation. For a family, if you have a concern that a child has behavioral health issues, start with your primary care provider, your pediatrician or family practitioner, and and see what they have to recommend, and they can start to help with a diagnosis, but let them know that this program is available and funded by the state where they can get the support they need to help clarify, is there a significant diagnosis? Are there medications that should be considered? Should we refer him, the child, to a counselor for some therapy? They can can get this real-time consultation while the family is right in the office so that the program is very accessible across the entire state. They divided it up by medical schools across the state. So if you're in the Dallas and eastern part of our listing area, the program is administered by Children's and University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. If you're in Tarrant County and on the western side of the listing area, It's administered by the University of North Texas Health Science Center. But it's available to everyone in real time during business hours, Monday through Friday, with the goal of making behavioral health services, assessment, and treatment more accessible to everyone across the state of Texas. So I'd like to give the the phone number uh, because this number is is available to everyone across the state, and it's 888 901-CPAN, which is 2726, and the consultations are provided Monday through Friday during normal business hours, so when you have an appointment for your child at the primary care office, they can access this program right while you're there for the visit and start to get treatment um, going for your child, and and the key of all of this is early identification and intervention. As you said, before it gets to a point where a child is 
doing something to harm themselves or thinking about that. We want to make services available so that symptoms are identified as early on as possible when they're very, very manageable. You know, Sue, uh, such great advice. And for the last three years, you've been a solid supporter of Intercom, KRLD, and their I'm Listening program, dealing with removing the stigma of seeking behavioral health treatment and preventing suicide. My final question to you, pretend like you can see all the listeners that are listening to you right now, and you can see the anguish on their face and how worried they are about their child or adolescent who's exhibiting some of those symptoms that you talked about. Give them some closing advice on what they should do. Yeah, that's a great question, and and I can imagine that vision. My advice is talk about it. Don't push it under the rug. Don't think it's going to go away. Don't think it's just a phase. Talk about it. Get help. Support your loved ones, and it will be okay. You can, you can get better. That's the good news is that we have wonderful treatments for depression, anxiety, and all of these mental illnesses now. So you can get better, but the first step is to talk about it and address it. You're listening to Sue Shell from Children's Health in the Metroplex talking about how to help our kids through mental health. We're talking about this ahead of I'm Listening, a special program September 23rd here on 1080 KRLD and radio.com from 6 to 8 p.m. We hope you'll make a special note to listen to this to bring attention to this very important area. And these entire conversations on the show today are on our podcast. Simply search your podcast app for the human side of healthcare. We'll be right back. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever changing healthcare environment. This is the human side of healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co host Thomas Miller. And welcome back to the human side of healthcare. We're going to continue our discussion with Sue Shell, the Vice President and Clinical Director of Behavioral Health at Children's Health, and we're delighted she's with us. Steve, you actually got really close to this next conversation in the last segment. And unbeknownst to a lot of parents, there is a really critical age window for many kids who have traumatic events in their lives. I had somebody who worked in a particular ministry tell me about this years ago, and they said that they just saw this consistent pattern. So that's where we pick up in this segment with Steve Love and Sue Shell from Children's Health. Sue, so I've heard from many healthcare professionals that children, especially between the ages of, say, 10 and 14, can have some kind of trauma or some experience in their life that could impact them for the rest of their lives. Why are those particular years so important? And if so, how do you term this or what's the condition actually called? Yeah, that's what we refer to as adverse childhood experiences. Children that have some type of traumatic event, and it could be as early as birth. Children born into extreme poverty. Um, children born into unsecure homes where family members are not consistent or able to give the consistent nurturing that a young child needs, that changes how our brain develops. The neural pathways that are developing at a very young age, connections that are being made, when a child is in a stressful environment, those neural pathways connect differently and certain parts of the brain become overdeveloped. The parts that, that have the stress response getting flooded with uh, the stress hormones versus other parts of the brain that are needed for development, for creative thinking, problem solving, those kind of take a back seat because the brain is so focused on survival, if you will of, you know, a child coming home from school thinking, I wonder what we're going to have to eat tonight, or I wonder if there's going to be gunshots in the neighborhood. That creates a traumatic experience and environment 
for a child that becomes toxic. And we know that children raised in those environments and with those experiences, they don't develop the same level of resilience and coping skills that children raised in nurturing environments do. And so, yes, that leads to drug abuse, that leads to more risk-taking as adolescents, it leads to uh, crime and other behaviors that, that are risk-taking. And, you know, some people say, oh, well, they're bad people. They're not bad people. That's the only way they could survive. That's how they learn to cope, that if they are so stressed, but when they drink or smoke marijuana, they feel a little more relaxed, that becomes a coping skill. And unfortunately, then those coping skills develop other more serious problems that have to be addressed. But adverse childhood experiences growing up in a very stressful environment are medically shown to cause more long-term chronic mental health and medical issues in adulthood. Sue, let's say we have a couple, and this couple of parents, they've got kids, and those kids fall right in that age group you were just talking about. How do the parents deal with their problems and at the same time be supportive and help their kids? You don't want to remain in a stressful, unhappy environment because that that also has implications on, on the child. So the point is to be talking with your, your pediatrician, your providers, letting them know what's going on in the home. That, you know, health care isn't just, you know, your, your blood pressure and heart rate and physical symptoms. Health care includes behavioral health and emotional symptoms. And our emotional responses and feelings impact our overall health and need to be addressed in regular medical visits. Um, Assessing for depression is now common for physicians and encouraged by the American Academy of Pediatrics to assess for depression in adolescents because it is so common. So so you don't want to necessarily put off change, but you want to recognize that change is stressful and talk about it with your children and and provide them with the understanding at an age appropriate level of why things are occurring the way they are and and reassuring them that we're still a family and we'll get through this together uh, kids kids need to be reassured just like we do as an adult um, in stressful times and they look to adults to provide that guidance so you know, parents need to, to deal with their own emotions and, and probably get counseling themselves in those stressful situations and then also learn how to help their children. Um, and a lot of counseling for children is, is working with the parents and helping them learn how to provide those skills so that the child can grow up with good resilience and, and coping skills to, to manage change and stress because that's a part of life all the time. So we have to learn how to manage it. Sue, if you look to the future and you could envision not needing a program like I'm listening to deal with mental health, what would that future really look like and how do we get there from here? Yeah, that's a great question. That future would, uh, be one where people are secure in understanding their feelings and talking about feelings and where it was not a problem to say, I'm having a really bad day. I, I really don't know if I can do this. Um, and, and getting the support you need from, from other people and acknowledging that everybody has bad days. Everybody has weeks and months sometimes that are better than others Um, and talking about it and learning how to cope and not being afraid to admit to emotional weakness. um, That's, that's the future that will make us all more healthy that will, will let us address these things. And as Steven said, not having a stigma about it, you know, there's no shame in, in having cancer or diabetes or heart disease. So there shouldn't be shame in having any 
medical illness or mental health illness like depression or anxiety. Um, we should have the same compassion for that. Thomas, you know, that was fascinating talking to Sue and to Sherry, and we've really focused on behavioral health and obviously preventing suicide. And, you know, we want to remind our listeners once again, September the 23rd, I'm listening. It's going to be broadcast on the station at 6 p.m. It's going to be a two-hour broadcast. There are going to be national celebrities, and people are here to listen. People are here to help. My biggest takeaway from this whole process has been how many people are struggling right now. COVID has really compounded this. So the 2020 I'm listening is by far the most important one to date. You know, you bring up an excellent point with people who have sheltered in place. They've been at home. Unfortunately, many people have been furloughed or lost their jobs. They're facing all kinds of pressures, not only emotional pressures, but Pressures related to finances, getting their kids back to school, virtual uh, schools. It is it is tough right now. It's tough. And you are so right. I'm listening this year is probably the most important year thus far. Well, and if think about if you ask her, what if a world existed where we didn't ha- need I'm listening? What if a world existed where there was no COVID? And Steve, how would we get there? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to get there until we get herd immunity. And of course, we heard a lot about vaccines. But I do know this. We can coexist with it until we do get there by wearing a mask, physical distancing, washing our hands, and talking about this year being important, get your flu shot. All right, you stay safe, sir, and we will be back next week. We're going to be talking about sepsis, and we're going to be talking about the very large reach of Baylor, Scott, and White and some research that they're doing into COVID. That's going to be on the show next week. We look forward to it. We hope you'll tune in, be safe, and have a good week.